Good morning. My name is Haron Petuidius. I'm the Head of Strategic Communications for the IRR, the Institute of Race Relations. South Africa faces a fundamental choice, not just as this is an election year, but because the country is entering uncharted territory where we are departing from previous ages of governance. We face the choice between poverty and growth. South Africa is divided essentially into the pro-growth forces and the pro-poverty forces. Economic growth is the most effective cure to the many social ills that plague South Africa today. For too long, economic growth has not been the focus of government policy. For too long, it has not been the focus of even political debate. We are pleased to see that climate changing and we are pleased today to launch a series of papers called the IRR's Blueprint for Growth. Today's paper, the author of which joins me today, Dr. John Endress, the IRR's CEO, is titled Arming SA's Pro-Growth Forces. That is essentially what the IRR wants to do, and it is essentially what South Africa needs to discover in itself, the willingness to fight for growth. The pro-growth forces in South Africa range from the political to the ordinary civilian on the street. Everyone has a role to play in promoting this idea of a pro-growth South Africa. A pro-growth South Africa means education that is affordable and high quality, not based on your socioeconomic status, but based on your talents. A pro-growth South Africa means an upward tide of job creation, of businesses rediscovering open channels of investment, of sentiment towards South Africa's investment climate changing for the positive. It means unlocking the potential of South Africa's ingenuity and our entrepreneurs, the drivers of small businesses and job creation. To arm these forces, the data, the facts, the arguments, the evidence is necessary to change the conversation from one about how we have failed as a country to how we can succeed as a country needs an armed pro-growth force in South Africa. I'm very proud that we are launching this series of publications and Dr. John Endress, who wrote to this paper, will this morning take us through its highlights and its fundamental conclusions, presenting to our audience today in South Africa broadly the question of how to arm our pro-growth forces in this time of choice. We cannot let pro-poverty forces win. That has too often been the case in countries across the world where potential has been squandered because poverty was chosen over a growth strategy. John, we look forward to hearing you set out how the IRR has a plan to reverse this. Thank you very much, Hermann, and good morning to all of you. Yes, so what this really is about is that, uh, in our view, economic growth is probably the most radically transformative thing that South Africa can do to change its trajectory, its outcomes. Uh, and it is our view that this really should be uh, the main focus of political activity and policies in South Africa to make sure that uh, the country gets the growth that it needs. We present today as part of our Blueprint for Growth series, uh, the first paper, Arming SA's Pro-Growth Forces. And uh, what we'll be talking about today is, let me just see if I can get the slides to move. There we go. Firstly, why South Africa needs economic growth so badly. Secondly, uh, an argument for how much growth is needed. And then we'll go into some of the detail of the policy changes that are needed to trigger the kind of growth the country needs. And those are, are four groups uh, of, of policy changes. But let's get straight into, into the arguments um, about why South Africa needs growth. And we'll start out by looking at South Africa's current situation. Um, I'll go through that quite quickly because most of you will be familiar with that. But South Africa, as it is now, has been growing at a very, very low rate, uh, certainly since about 2018, when President Ramaphosa took over, at about half a percent uh, per annum. And since 2008, the growth rate has been about 1.2 percent, and that really is anemic. It is very, very low and far too little to make a substantial dent in unemployment figures and also in income figures for South Africans. We also have very, very high unemployment, about 30 percent on the narrow definition. 
if you include people who've given up looking for work, the so-called discouraged job seekers, that unemployment rate rises to over 40%. It's uh, sitting at about 42% at the moment. And that really is a, a very uh, dramatic indictment of the policies that we've got in South Africa. Public finances are in a terrible state with debt levels above 70%. Uh, we'll be hearing the budget speech from the finance minister tomorrow. And we'll be very interested to see how he deals with this considerable challenge of getting uh, debt under control while the, while the demands on spending are so great. Uh, and we'll also be making a public finance proposal on Thursday, for which you should be uh, receiving your invitations shortly. As a result of all of this, we've got record low confidence in the business sector amongst investors and consumers. And all of this is really slowing down the economy and also slowing down job creation. Unemployment, I think, is the uh, should be front of mind as we think about South Africa's situation. Uh, when we ask the South Africans in our surveys what their main priority is, the top issue that they'd like to see solved, uh, unemployment is always top of the list. And no wonder. We've got about 8 million people unemployed in South Africa, uh, out of whom about 80% have been unemployed for over a year. So they are long-term unemployed and find it more difficult to get back into the job market. Um, with only a fifth short-term unemployed. It also means that many South Africans are dependent on others for income. So we've seen the social uh, welfare, social security figures, and really vast parts of the population are dependent on social grants. Uh, for about 24% of households in South Africa, a social grant is the main primary source of income for that household. And for about 50% of households, um, there's at least one social grant being paid to the household. And that really is illustrative of how uh, vast the need for income is and how little prospect there is for people to earn it through their own efforts. That is why they are reliant on social grants. As a result of all of this, um, of course, South Africans are pretty frustrated. Um, they wonder what their prospects are. Um, they wonder what uh, they can do about the situation. And while they are in the uh, position of being dependent on the state for their income, they have very little way uh, of doing anything about this, of increasing their incomes or improving their prospects. Right, so the argument I want to make is a, a three-step argument for you. Um, firstly, um, I want to argue, and it maybe needs to be said, that it is better to be wealthy than to be poor. That may seem obvious, um, but certainly in the developed world, there is a very a vehement movement underway at the moment called the degrowth movement, uh, which holds that uh, it's, it's better not to increase the wealth of individuals or societies, but rather to leave things as they are, um, for example, for environmental reasons uh, and resource reasons. That is not an argument we buy into. Uh, we think it is far better to, to be wealthy, to be well off as a society, as an individual, than to be poor. And the reason for that is that having access uh, to more resources is a result of higher income. It also means that you have fewer existential worries. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from. And you have far more options in life if you have reasonable access to resources. Wealthier societies on the whole also demonstrate much uh, greater levels of health and longer life expectancies. And of course, years of life is the most valuable thing that a person can have. Uh, and increasing lifespans, I think, should be a public policy goal, and that is linked very closely to higher incomes. Wealthier societies also have cleaner environments as people have the ability to worry about the state of their environment rather than having to worry about their next meal. They have better public services and also less violent crime. So all of these are arguments for why uh, policy should be focusing on, um, on higher uh, levels of income, on greater wealth, and how do you get more wealth? Well, you get it through a growing economy, through economic growth. If you don't have economic growth, then you're not going to step up. You're not going to get to that point of uh, being better off uh, as a society or indeed as an individual. How do you get economic growth? Well, you get that through economic freedom. Uh, and for that reason, you'll see that as we go through this presentation, that what we are promoting are the types of policies that empower individual citizens to make more choices about their lives and their activities, and that also free up businesses and individuals to make business and economic choices about their lives. 
Also, if you look at the statistics, um, you can uh, uh, view a chart like this, for example. So what you see here is from the year 2008 to about the present, South Africa's GDP per capita compared to global GDP per capita. And this is a rough measure of, of, uh, of wealth in a society. The numbers given here are shown in US dollars and they are inflation adjusted. So this is the, the real effect of wealth development in the world. And you'll see that while in 2008, the GDP per capita in South Africa was effectively the same as the average for the whole world. Since then, South Africa's GDP per capita has stayed constant at about $13,500 or so, while the rest of the world has pulled ahead to $17,500. And this is an indication of how badly South Africa has been underperforming since 2008. And another way of looking at this is to set global GDP per capita at a level of one, and then just seeing how South Africa's GDP per capita has developed since then. So when the blue line is on top of the dotted gray line, it means that South Africa's GDP per capita is the same as that in the world. But as you can see, it's been drifting downwards, trending downwards. And right now, South Africa's GDP per capita is only about 77% of world average GDP per capita. So really, we have fallen far behind, um, and there's a, a lot the country should be doing to catch up again. Um, and what we need for that is higher growth rates. And for higher growth rates, we need better policies. Um, okay. So how much growth do we need? We're going to put a, a figure up of 7%. Um, we realize that's ambitious. and You're not going to get there overnight. But that ultimately is the figure we should be aiming for. And the reason for that is that this simple GDP growth rate really is um, essentially determining how quickly an economy becomes wealthier. And an easy way to calculate this is to divide 70 by the growth rate in percent, and that will tell you how many years it takes to double the size of the economy. In South Africa's case, um, so if, you, if we had a 7% growth rate, it would mean that the economy would be doubling in size in 10 years. But that's not what we've got at the moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over the past 15 years, our average growth rate has been only 1.2%. And at a 1.2%, it will take 58 years for the economy to double in size. And that means South Africans are going to be poor for a whole while longer. Uh, and it also means that we will fall further and further behind compared to the rest of the world that has higher growth rates. Um, finally, also, of course, the reason such a high growth rate is necessary is because that is what you need to get unemployment down. With a 7% growth rate, South Africa would be able to bring its 32% uh, unemployment rate down into single digits over a period of 10 years. So that would uh, enable us to get to a 9.9% unemployment rate, so just, just in the single digits. Uh, and this kind of growth rate would also allow both the new entrants into the job market to find jobs, as well as the existing uh, unemployed to be drawn into the job market, bringing that unemployment level down over time. So really uh, getting growth right is absolutely essential, um, and it should be a core focus of any political party in South Africa right now. Question, of course, is how do you get to 7%? Because that seems like a very ambitious target. Um, you do it stepwise, like eating an elephant one bite at a time. Firstly, you have to get your policies right. Um, you will then be rewarded with escalating growth rates. You might go at 3% per annum for three years, then 5% per annum for five years, and ultimately 7% per annum, hopefully for seven years. If you do this consistently, the country is going to be radically transformed. Uh, it would be unrecognizable in a decade or two from now, and uh, it would be a much happier country than it is right now. So how to get higher growth rates? We propose four uh, groups of policies. The first one is that you need to increase direct investment. To illustrate where the shortfall lies at the moment, this is what our gross fixed capital formation indicator looks like since 2008. And this is an indicator that measures, as a share of GDP, how much money gets invested into fixed assets. And that means things like factories, infrastructure, 
heavy machinery and equipment. So things made of steel and concrete and tar that take a lot of investment uh, and that you can't easily move around as well. That's why it's fixed capital. Um, this is very important. You need it for economic growth because it allows, for example, factories to manufacture goods which can be sold. And it also allows goods to be shipped and moved around to where the customers are. So you need roads, you need um, railways, you need the ports to be working. So the whole infrastructure, including, of course, electricity and water, needs to be functioning properly to get high growth rates. However, South Africa's uh, gross fixed capital formation rate looks like this. It's on a downward trend. It was at around 21, 22% in 2008. That was ahead of the Soccer World Cup of 2010. Uh, so quite a lot of investment going on at the time um, for uh, stadia and for upgrading infrastructure. But since then, fixed capital formation has been declining and it is now sitting at a rate of about 14, 15%, where the target rate for an emerging economy should be around 24, 25%. And the government's own target, as formulated in its national development plan, was actually 30%, 30%. So we really are very far removed from that, and we need to get the investment rate up if the economy is to grow. How do we do that? Well, firstly, you've got to remove the threats to property rights. So the South African government is in, uh, has embarked on an endeavor to introduce expropriation without compensation as one example. And that is something that investors do not like. Uh, imagine you know, you've got a, a few million or, or billions lying around that you want to uh, invest somewhere in order to generate profit. But the jurisdiction that you're moving into tells you explicitly that it might uh, take away assets without compensation. It might try to reassure you that uh, your assets won't be affected, but can you trust the government that is willing to deprive legitimate owners of property of their property without compensation? So EWC needs to be scrapped in order for investment to go up. Otherwise, we're not going to get very far. In a similar vein, it's not only the government that tries to take away your property, it's also criminals. Um, and once again, investors are going to look at an environment. They're going to be worried uh, if they, in their personal safety, are going to be affected uh, in, in a country like South Africa, or indeed if their assets are going to be lost to crime, to riots, to violence, to looting. So you need to address the crime problem as well. Uh, you need to fix the police, the law enforcement agencies, uh, the criminal justice system to address the crime problem in a sustained and serious manner. You also have to create a competitive investment climate. The notion here being that South Africa shouldn't think of itself as existing in isolation from the rest of the world. We have quite a few car factories in South Africa, for example, and the reality is that these car factories are competing against other locations, other jurisdictions. If Toyota or Ford or Mercedes, uh, VW, uh, are thinking about uh, expanding a factory, for example, then South Africa is going to be competing against places like Mexico, like Brazil, like Slovenia, um, uh, like China, and it needs to make an argument for itself. Currently, uh, the investment climate is not hospitable in South Africa. Investors feel that there's a great deal of hostility from the government towards them, and that really does not attract and draw an investment in the way that is needed for the economy to grow. Finally, you also need to create an entrepreneur-friendly economic climate. Uh, and once again, uh, you need an investment environment where entrepreneurs ranging from the smallest scale to the largest scale feel that there's an opportunity to build uh, and create a business that will be profitable, that will be good for them and their families. Once you've got that kind of environment, then people will be willing to invest in the environment. Um, currently, we know that many investors really prefer to have their assets offshore. Um, they don't feel comfortable being exposed to the South African policy and governance environment. So boosting investment, that's the first important thing you've got to do. The second thing we need to fix is, of course, the infrastructure. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, you really need uh, quite a lot of infrastructure components to work together for the economy to grow. And our highlight indicator here is, of course, electricity. Um, for those uh, on the call who are South Africans, you'll be aware of load shedding and how it affects us in our daily lives. It also caps economic growth at probably a percent 
also per year uh, far too little to make a dent in, uh, in wealth or unemployment. What we show you here is the total amount of electricity produced by ESCOM each year. And you can see it has been on a downward trend since 2008 to 2023, uh, down by about a fifth or so, which is uh, completely crazy in a country with a growing population and uh, with a supposedly growing economy. This is not what you want to see on a trend line uh, if you want your economy to grow. You need electricity to production to go up, electricity consumption to go up, and that is uh, both an enabler and an indicator of a growing economy. How do you do it? Well, firstly, you've got to bring in the private sector. We see this beginning to happen in electricity, for example, uh, partly with the uh, uh, support of the government that uh, wants this to happen, but also partly bypassing the government. If you think of the many companies, individuals who've installed solar power, uh, they've gone ahead and done that because uh, they can't run their businesses, they can't run their homes without electricity. So people just go ahead and uh, create the infrastructure they need uh, and really the skills, the resources, the know-how for fixing the infrastructure are now, I think, very widely housed in the private sector uh, and the private sector needs to be brought in in order to fix the problems that we are facing. Secondly, uh, we need to use various forms of pu private public partnerships uh, in order to get the public infrastructure repaired as well. An example here would be the rail corridor to Richards Bay, which is where we export a lot of our coal from. Because of problems on the railway line and at the port, exports have been declining year on year. Uh, and now what we are seeing is many of the companies that need that corridor for their exports coming in um, and helping to secure it, for example, against vandalism and theft and making that railway work again. So we're going to see a lot more of that in future. And that really. Next, to privatize the SOEs um, in a responsible and uh, a properly paced manner. But I think there's no really no way around it. We've seen the figures uh, circulating in recent days of the amount of bailouts provided to the SOEs in recent years, 281 billion rand. Uh, it, it, things cannot continue like this. Um, the SOEs are underperforming. They are consuming vast resources. And because they are state-owned and making losses, they're also not paying taxes. Um, so if you privatize the SOEs, you benefit in multiple ways as the state. Firstly, you have the revenue from selling the SOEs. But secondly, you uh, no longer have the obligation to bail out the SOEs. And thirdly, if they are uh, turned profitable, they would be paying taxes on their revenue. And again, that would be uh, a benefit for the state and the fiscus. Lastly, we need to be aware of the risks in privatization uh, in Eastern Europe, in some parts like Russia, for example, uh, privatization really was used as a process that allowed oligarchs to take hold uh, and uh, grab ownership of very large investments, very large assets um, that uh, opened up the door for corruption and for authoritarian politics. So in privatization, it is really important to have open and competitive processes that prevent corruption, cronyism, and also new monopolies. So our first uh, group was to boost investment. The second was to fix the infrastructure. The third thing we need to do is make it possible for millions more people to come into the job market. Our headline statistic here is just the number of unemployed broken down by long-term versus short-term unemployed. And what we see is that uh, the long-term unemployed with over, uh, uh, which are the bars marked in red are around 80% of the total unemployed population. So both the absolute numbers are too high, but also the long-term unemployment figure is too high. And that is something that needs urgent, urgent addressing. How do we do it? Uh, how do we create jobs? Well, firstly, and most obviously, uh, growth will to create demand for jobs. Um, so if you get growth going, if you get it sparking, if you get it moving, you are going to be creating jobs because businesses are going to need more people uh, to, to work, um, to, to produce products and services for the economy. Uh, so growth itself is the main thing that you need to create in order to uh, create jobs in South Africa. Secondly, we need to look at our labor market legislation. Uh, we need to lower the barriers to entry 
for job seekers. Currently, there's a whole uh, raft of bits of regulation and legislation that make it difficult for people to get into the job market. One example here would be the national, national minimum wage, which is set at a very high level in South Africa. It is uh, very close to the median wage, which means that by introducing the national minimum wage at such a high level, we effectively made half the working population illegal. Um, plus also we have this enormous number of unemployed people, over 40%, who um, will find it harder to get into the job market if the minimum wage is set so high, because businesses then you know, are going to try to reduce the number of people they hire rather than maximizing the number of people they hire. Thirdly, we need to improve business conditions for labor intensive sectors. Uh, so there are some sectors that absorb a lot of labor, like agriculture, like mining, like manufacturing, like tourism. And these sectors uh, specifically need to find business conditions being eased uh, for them so that they can employ more and more people. And that will create a virtuous spiral of more growth and also more labor absorption. Lastly, we also need to attract skilled labor by easing immigration procedures. So it's a, a constant complaint. We hear from uh, international companies, embassies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who uh, cannot fathom why it is so difficult to get a working visa uh, for, for expats, for experts coming into the country. Uh, we should be making a concerted effort to make that a lot easier for such skilled individuals to come to South Africa to bring their skills, bring their resources, bring their assets, make it easy for them to invest. And one way of doing this would be to aggressively sell South Africa as a lifestyle destination. Um, it is a very attractive place to live in terms of the uh, quality of life it offers, um, the amenities it offers, and that is a selling point that South Africa should be exploiting and making use of. And South Africa, of course, can also target expats uh, who have a link to the country, um, have left South Africa, but uh, might be willing to come back when situations improve here in South Africa. Finally, the fourth group of policies that we need to work on is uh, to broaden and speed up economic participation. Currently, we have a system where uh, a very large share of the population is really not involved in the economy, um, but rather is re the recipient of state services and welfare, but not really taking part in the economy as such. The labor absorption rate serves to illustrate this um, from 2008 to 2023, is sitting at around 40%. Um, this is the share of the working age population that is actually working, uh, and that should be sitting at about 60, 70%. So it is just an illustration of how economic participation is very, very low in South Africa, and that needs to be boosted quite considerably. How do we do that? Firstly, we've got to replace race-based uh, empowerment policies with needs-based empowerment policies. Uh, so replace BEE with a uh, concept developed by the IRR called um, Economic Empowerment for the Disadvantaged, which would be means-based rather than, than race-based, and also would focus very much on rewarding businesses for supporting growth and expanding opportunity. In other words, instead of getting points for the number of uh, black, colored, Indian, white people on staff, a business would get points for investing in the economy for the amount of taxes that it pays, for the jobs that it creates, for the exports that it generates, which are ultimately the, the, the outcomes that we need to see in terms of economic growth. And that is what businesses should be rewarded for. Um, as mentioned above, we should be selecting beneficiaries on socioeconomic grounds rather than racial. Uh, as happens now with the SASA grants, for example, which are not uh, racially indexed, that should be uh, continue to be the approach that we use in South Africa. And also the existing cash grants need to be kept in place um, in the situation that the country is in currently. With economic growth and more jobs being created, uh, fewer grants would be necessary. But currently, uh, these cash grants play a very important role in keeping the wool from the door uh, and fending off destitution and starvation. So uh, they have to be kept at this stage in South Africa's history. Finally, we know that education and health particularly, and also housing, are sectors where the state performs very poorly. Our proposal here is that a voucher system should be introduced where uh, uh, state funding is supplied in the form of vouchers to South Africans on a means-tested basis 
for them to spend on education, health and housing. The notion being that individuals are better able to make choices about where to spend their money than government bureaucrats are, and therefore the choice to, to uh, make these spending decisions should be placed in the hands of ordinary South Africans. Uh, and that can be done through a voucher system, similar to the, the SASA system, which uh, is a system that works well and is quite effective. So that is the proposal for how to broaden part economic participation. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. And uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, John. Um, so the first question that we have is with regards to population growth. This is an argument that we often hear that um, the population growth in South Africa is somehow an impediment to economic growth. Um, what would your take on that be and how is there a way to address this issue um, satisfactorily? Yeah, I, I used to think that as well. Um, I no longer do. Um, I've been persuaded by the argument of the economist Julian Simon who argued that the greatest resource that any society has or any economy has are people. Uh, because people are ultimately what uh, who generate value, who are innovative, who are able to come up with solutions for problems, uh, and having more people is actually a good thing. A recent book released, I think last year, uh, by Marion Tupi and Gary Tooley, called Superabundance, goes into the mathematics of this. It illustrates very clearly how um, uh, American society certainly became vastly more wealthy as more people were added to that society rather than uh, saying, you know, with fewer people, there would be more to go around. No, that's not how it works. You've got more people, they produce more, and they do so exponentially and create more and more wealth. There is, however, a proviso to that, uh, a subject to, and that is that you need the right policy environment for that to work. So in other words, if you have a policy environment like we do in South Africa that is not really conducive to growth, to innovation, uh, to human freedom, to exploration, then... Uh, the outcome is not so good and you end up with uh, what, what concerns many uh, observers looking at South Africa and also at the, the more under, underdeveloped parts of the world. They say, well, the people just keep coming, but the economy is not large enough to provide for all of them. So I understand the concern, but really the, the appropriate response, in my view, is to welcome uh, the, the people who join South Africa's population, but really to um, offer the possibility and the freedom and the environment for them to be productive and to grow the economy by adding value for their fellow South Africans. Um, that, that's where, where, the, where the conversation should be heading, in my view. Yeah, and no, I think you're quite right. And, and there are, the, the research on this is, is actually quite uh, intriguing and interesting and looks into multiple levels of this question. One can, for example, look at China and India that have, mm -hmm. um, over similar periods, experienced economic uh, growth and one study, uh, I think, from an Australian university, found that the um, there was a definitive population growth dividend in India, where a similar dividend wasn't perhaps experienced in China. So I think you are quite right. It, it does boil down to what is the socio-economic policy context in which this population growth is taking place. I I'm sorry, may I just have on. So I just wanted to add something to that, which is looking a bit further ahead into the future. Um, I think, you know, many people are still worried about overpopulation up to the year 2100, for example. But I now get the very strong sense that we are soon going to be more worried about underpopulation than overpopulation. So most of the world is already experiencing slowdowns in population growth rates, uh, aging populations, which is going to introduce huge economic distortions um, as the dependency ratio climbs, more and more old people become dependent on the few productive young people um, in the economy. So um, keep an eye on that. Uh, you know, just, just watch how the, the conversation is going to start changing from being worried about overpopulation to the concern about what to do with um, aging and declining populations. And here again, in South Africa and Africa, we are uh, in, in somewhat of an outlier position because Africa is the only continent where pop population is still relatively young and also growing relatively fast. So if we just get the, that, that switch right to better policy environment, enabling human flourishing and providing more freedom for individuals, 
then uh, Africa is actually going to be a really exciting place to be uh, in the next few decades or so. Our next question uh, cuts to the question uh, to the issue of corruption and economic growth. Um, quite often in South Africa, we hear the narrative that uh, the wasted Zuma years, the corruption of the Zuma years, that is what has been causing the main breakage um, in terms of South Africa's forward economic momentum. What would you say to that? I think it's a, it's a very appealing notion on the face of it. Um, so in our analysis, we've regularly pointed out how there's a, a distinct break in South Africa's development that happens around 2008. So from 1994 to 2008, the, the average growth rate was about 3.6%. Uh, the number of people with jobs increased from 8 million to 14 and a half million. Uh, the deficits were turned into surpluses. The public debt was halved. So that was actually a period of quite good outcomes in, across all sorts of indicators. But then comes the year 2008, and you see all the markets turn negative. Uh, you see economic growth declining. You see uh, public debt tripling. You see uh, the number of jobs not increasing properly. You see GDP per capita stagnating. And it was very appealing to pinpoint that transition to uh, Jacob Zuma and to state capture. I think it is partly correct, but not entirely correct. And the proviso here is that many of the uh, failures of the Zuma era have their origins in the and in the time before that, in that uh, already during those times, the ANC was pursuing policies uh, like uh, the racialization of public procurement, the racialization of employment policy, um, and state capture through the mechanism of cater deployment that led to the outcomes that we then saw from 2008 and onwards. So the groundwork was being laid before that year, but really we, we started uh, reaping the bitter fruits of those policies from 2008 onwards. If we want to turn around, um, it means that it's not enough to get rid of Jacob Zuma. It's not enough to get rid of state capture. It's actually the whole set of rules that enabled this to occur that needs to be reformed. Uh, and that is what we at the IR are working towards uh, we wish to see South Africa uh, get onto a much higher, higher growth path, uh, and uh, that has to be done through policy reform. Have one. Then we have a very interesting question here um, regarding vouchers. Um, what is the main argument, or what is the argument made against vouchers? What examples of vouchers could be pointed to? Uh, so, Dylan, there's. there's um, quite a lot of literature, especially on education vouchers, and especially from the United States. And in the United States, it must be said that the evidence on vouchers is ambivalent. So sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And where they don't work, for example, um, there seems to be a process of, of cherry picking going on, where uh, voucher based schools are able to um, get better students, attract better students, leaving worse students in the non-voucher public education system, uh, the performance of which then declines, um, and the this, this sort of gap is seen as a, a, a point of criticism against vouchers. So I think you always have to look at the context to see if it is a good proposal or not. Uh, our sense is that in the South African context, where education has been so terribly underperforming, producing some of the worst outcomes in the world, with 81% uh, of standard fours, uh, grade four, sorry, not being able to read or write uh, 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 a text in their own mother tongue, you know, that, that's a disastrous outcome. And I think in this kind of context, really, what we need is competition in the education system, where schools that perform well are able to attract more resources in the form of pupils who come bearing vouchers. Um, we need this competition to uh, emerge. We need the bad schools to be starved of funding to the point where they ever, where they either improve their performance or shut down. And we need also these vouchers to be deployed to the good schools. They need to be reinforced in the good work that they're doing. So that's the notion that really drives this, uh, this push for vouchers. Uh, the same applies also to the healthcare system. Uh, we know that the government has been opposed for a long time to low cost health insurance options um, for, for lower income South Africans. Um, the regulator has prohibited such options from being made available, but that ultimately would be transformative. Um, such vouchers can be offered, can be funded by the state 
but the services, of course, can be provided by the private sector, um, often much more cheaply and at a much better quality than by the public sector. Finally, um, we do ask respondents in our polling what they think about the voucher idea, and support for vouchers really is very, very high, um, at the level of about 80, 90 percent of people in favor of vouchers, uh, and just liking the idea of being able to choose which school to send their children to, um, and being able to come with that voucher and say, I demand service, I demand a good education for my kid, um, and I've, I'm, I'm the one paying, therefore I'm going to insist that the quality be good. Herman. Then we get to, I think, one of the elephants in the room, uh, race-based policies. Um, a few years ago, our colleague uh, Anthea Jeffrey, the head of research and policy research at the IRR, um, wrote a book, uh, BEE, Helping or Hurting. Um, it, I think I could uh, recommend it to, to everyone listening. But in the IRR's analysis, um, has BEE been helping or hurting the pursuit of economic growth? Mm. So I think it's important to understand your opponent's motivation in analyzing their policies. The IRR um, founded in 1929 to oppose racial discrimination has consistently um, presented uh, the position of not wanting to have race dis discrimination in public law and regulation. Uh, and that remains our principal position today. However, we can understand why at the dawn of South Africa's democracy after 1994, the argument might have been made, uh, we've had decades, if not centuries of racial discrimination. And to eliminate the effects of that, we need new racial discrimination to overcome it. However, after um, two decades now, roughly, of testing these policies, um, of having uh, used racial discrimination in South Africa, the evidence is in, and it has shown that it does not work. It does not produce the results that uh, even its supporters had anticipated or hoped it would produce. And we now face a situation where policies like BE, for example, have benefited some black people, but it is a very small minority. Uh, we believe it's about 15% of the black population that has access to the opportunities offered by BEE. However, 85% of the black population is excluded from those benefits and opportunities, and therefore suffers much worse outcomes than would have been the case if race-based policies had not been introduced in the first place. So the argument we're making now is that both on moral reasons, because discriminate, discriminating against people based on their race is wrong in our view, but also on practical reasons, based on the outcomes produced by these policies, racial discrimination in public policy should be abandoned. Um, it is not a successful policy, it is a harmful policy, and it is part of the explanation for why our growth is so low, why we battle to attract investment, uh, and these policies really need to be abandoned, um, scrapped, done away with, uh, in favor of non-racial policies that are focused on growth. Hermann. Then on to property rights. Um, does the IRR's strong advocation um, for the expansion of property rights put us in opposition to um, redress of land questions that date back more than a century and especially perhaps viciously applied by the apartheid government in the 1950s. Mm. So Looking at land specifically, one has to differentiate between land restitution and land redistribution. So land restitution applies in cases where um, a person or a family can uh, show that they were dispossessed and they can be made whole by having either their land returned to them or by having the equivalent um, financial compensation be paid to them. Um, that is a process that has been ongoing for many years now. Um, it is a just process and it is one that should continue. However, where a policy is pursued that seeks to uh, dispossess white people on the basis of race in favor of uh, black people on the basis of race, that is not something we support. Um, so this is a, a race-based policy where individuals are made to bear the consequences of what were collective injustices. 
Um, so we, we think you need to look at the individual rather than as the collective, uh, rather than at the collective when designing policies. Um, to which I would add that if you wish to see greater equality between the races in South Africa, the way to do that again is through economic growth. Um, currently, the biggest inequality in South Africa um, is between the unemployed and the people with jobs. And there are very large numbers of unemployed people in South Africa. So that's really driving that gap in, in inequality. And we see particularly in the black population group where inequality is higher than in any other population group and also higher than it is in the population as a whole. Uh, and that is a result of bad economic policies, no growth, uh, no opportunity to improve your income status as an individual, as a household, uh, plus this discrepancy in employment levels. Uh, so that, that is where we would be focusing on. Get the economic growth right, and then you also equip people with the resources that they can then deploy uh, on their own behalf to, for example, purchase land if they wish to be landowners. Um, ultimately, this really is a money problem. Uh, you know, if, if you're black and you're poor, you can't buy land. But if you are black and you're wealthy, you can buy land. You know, there's a market for land. It's available for purchase. Uh, and that would be your, your buying decision. Uh, you might choose to do something else with your money uh, because land maybe is not the most productive asset that you can own. But you would have the choice. So again, incomes and wealth really represent choice and freedom. If you haven't got uh, income and wealth, then your choices are limited and, and the ability to, to pursue different courses of action is also limited. So you need to get the economic growth going in order to get the wealth going, to get the incomes up, and that will create so much more choice for so many more people that they can then exercise as they see fit. Then I would like to turn to a question about load chain. Um, in the IRR's analysis, especially in this growth analysis, um, what has been the impact of load chain on economic growth? And realistically speaking, is what has been uh, playing out over the last year or two in the revolution of residential and private uh, solar panel based generation for household use mainly, is that enough to end the load shedding crisis or should more be done, less be done, and you know, what should be done. All right. So yeah, I, I think certainly the economic impact has been quite devastating. Um, we've seen load shedding begin at the end of 2007. Um, so it's been going on for 17 years now without resolution. And as a matter of fact, it has been wor worsening over time. And the worse load shedding gets, the worse economic performance also gets because factories can't operate, uh, you know, tourism, uh, resorts, to destinations can't, can't properly uh, offer services to tourists. All sorts of things break down uh, when, when there's load shedding. Uh, transport, of course, also is affected. If you are a commuter, uh, if you've got a school run or you drive to work and there's load shedding and the traffic lights aren't working, uh, you know, you're losing time. And this is productive time that you're losing. So a huge impact and a huge problem. I think that the private sector contribution is helpful. I don't think it is sufficient to get us out of load shedding quickly. Um, and I think for us to get out of load shedding quickly does actually lead us to use the resources that we've got. And the most useful resource we've got is our coal-fired power stations. Uh, ESCOM tracks an indicator called the energy availability factor, which measures what percentage of total installed capacity is actually available to generate electricity at any given time. Uh, and that energy availability factor is now sitting at just over 50% in South Africa. So what this means is that you've got a huge fleet of power stations sitting out there, uh, of which only half are working. <laughs> that is absolutely insane. Um, so that South Africa has the means at hand for solving load shedding very easily, and that is to get that coal um, fleet working properly again. Doing that is the tricky, the tricky question. Um, I don't really think it's a question of uh, individual CEOs, for example, or, or the personalities that run the organization. It is a question of the policy environment in which they operate. And this policy environment currently one is one that is very politicized with a, a minister or three ministers at least interfering uh, in the operations of ESCOM, in the business, the commercial operations of ESCOM, and thereby reducing its, uh, its effectiveness. Secondly, you've got a set of legislation in place 
that prioritizes issues other than performance at ESCOM. And this includes, for example, um, hiring policies, uh, cadre deployment into the management echelons of ESCOM, uh, race-based transformation requirements for ESCOM, and race-based procurement requirements for ESCOM. All of these things are not conducive to running an operation like ESCOM on a commercial basis. So what needs to happen is that firstly, ESCOM needs to be freed from political interference. Its mandate must be clarified, which is to offer reliable electricity at the lowest cost. That's it. It should not have a transformation mandate beyond that. Secondly, it must be freed to hire and fire the people um, that it needs on its staff in order to fulfill this mandate. And thirdly, it must be put in a position to buy the components and inputs it needs to fulfill its mandate without having to worry about transformation and, and secondary objectives. So that, that is what needs to happen. The policy environment has to be addressed, it needs to be fixed, and then ESCOM can be fixed as well. I'll add one more, and that is accountability. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of corruption in ESCOM, and we also know from revelations by Andrew de Rota and others that it's very hard to uh, address this corruption, to fight the criminals behind it. Uh, so Uh, some of whom appear to be uh, in the uh, upper echelons of politics. So you need to address that as well. You've got to fight the criminal to get ESCOM going. Herman. Then turning towards um, perhaps the activities um, and interests and actions of South Africa's corporate sector, what can South Africa's corporate sector do to support economic growth? Because we at the IRR have been speaking to corporate interests and CEOs and boards and chairmen, uh, you know, important people in the business world. And behind closed doors, there's always this frustration with things simply not working. Beyond the, I think, change of climate that we are experiencing where this dissatisfaction is perhaps inching its way into a more public uh, setting and, and, and public debate. What can corporate South Africa do? What should corporate South Africa do as an actor to become part of the pro-growth coalition? So I think firstly, what businesses can do is to internalize the argument about the need for economic growth. I think there's in many companies still an ambivalence about this argument, um, which is uh, shaped and, and colored by the government's own competing uh, objectives and priorities. So business needs to, to uh, focus on growth as we are proposing politics do, business should do the same. And secondly, what business should do, I think is realize its uh, strength in its relationship with government. We're often uh, business is willing to uh, kowtow to uh, the government and to go along with whatever impositions uh, are, are placed upon it. I think that business needs to be more assertive, more, more transactional in the way that it deals with the government. And it should do so on the basis of promoting economic growth. Uh, we know that it's uncomfortable for businesses, for example, to call for the scrapping of race-based policies in procurement uh, or in employment. Um, but it is now able to make those arguments on the basis of economic growth and to show that better outcomes are achieved when such policies are abandoned. Uh, and it should do this uh, forthrightly um, uh, in its relationship with government. At the same time, of course, government is weakening currently. Uh, we see that the ANC in the polls is dropping. Uh, I think that also there's a certain lack of intellectual vigor within the ruling party. And that is an opportunity for business, as it is for civil society, to make its argument for economic growth, to make its case for economic growth, uh, and to, to get the, the economy growing again. Erwin. And then the final question for today's session, latching on to your previous answer. Ordinary South Africans approach the IRR on a daily basis, asking, what can we do to help? And in the context of this pro-growth coalition, what would you advise ordinary South Africans to do to promote this pro-growth argument and to really give momentum to the pro-growth coalition that the IRR is building? Well, again, I would say um, step one is to internalize the growth argument, um, understand what it means. It means prioritizing. It means uh, saying no to other public policy goals 
in favor of growth. 2024 is an election year in South Africa. So as an ordinary South African, as a voter, you have the opportunity to make this pro-growth argument through your vote. Look at the party manifestos of the various parties on offer and analyze them as to whether they will produce economic growth or not and make your cross at the ballot box accordingly. Share those arguments with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family. Explain to them how important growth is and how their vote matters in getting growth. Also make that argument in your relationship uh, with businesses. Um, so if you find a business that is endorsing policies that are anti-growth, uh, you know, write to the business and explain to them that you do not agree with this. If you are a customer, you have the ability to withhold your custom as a form of pressure. Uh, you can write in the media, you can speak out in public in, for, uh, in favor of economic growth and help to get this notion out there. And finally, what you should do is to support civil society organizations like the IRR and others that uh, promote growth. Um, they are dependent on your help, on your support, and you can make a difference by supporting organizations like the IRR with a small monthly do donation because then we can formulate and promote and aggressively sell these arguments in the public arena on your behalf. Herman. Thank you very much, John. Latching on to John's answer there, the strategy of the IRR is something that perhaps needs some understanding or at least explanation. We believe that political policy forms as the result of certain factors. That is why the IRR is trying to go upstream from the day-to-day -day politics that determine who governs our country. That is a vital question, of course, but if South Africans do not understand that influence goes above stream from politics through business, through civil societies, what we call the decision makers, the amplifiers and the activist citizens, then it will be very, very difficult to alter the state of our political climate, even in an election year. So with this first paper in the, in the IRR's Blueprint for Growth series, this is our first step as an organization to arm the pro-growth forces in South Africa with the data, the evidence, the arguments, and the opportunities needed for a pro-growth coalition to win, not just electorally, but to make South Africa a success the success it genuinely can be. And perhaps a final note from my side, economic growth is not about an Excel spreadsheet or a graph running in the right direction. It is about the very real human consequences of people being able to use their time and their talents as problem solvers within an accessible economic framework. That means it must be as easy as possible for you to use your skills, develop your skills to produce products or services and to buy products and services that will make your life better and earn the providers of those products and services and income. That at the heart of it is what pro-growth policies are about. The ability of you to earn, to work hard and to see others around you succeed as well. I thank you for your time this morning. John, I thank you for your time. We are sure to meet again, and we, I urge everyone to read this great piece of work that John has written, the first in a series that will give the arguments, the evidence, the data, and the opportunities to turn things around. I thank you very much, and we'll see you again.